Okay. Well, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Hero Makers Podcast. And and you know that I actually, in an earlier episode, I was too excited. And I had said we were on our 60th episode because I think I feel like we've been doing this forever, which is actually a good thing. Like, it's not bad. We're only on like 52 or 53. And I'm like, how is that possible? We need to like pick up, pick up the pace here and get going, right? Because there's like amazing people. Whatever that to. is when you, um, you like, wish it to happen whatever that thing is that's what right. you're doing that's right yeah. that's what I was doing so we're gonna get there in eight episodes <laughs> it'll be a reality and how are you I'm good it's Friday so yeah. I'm pretty pumped for the weekend yeah I was teaching my my son this concept of TGIF and oh. he wasn't understanding it because he thinks Thursday is the best because Friday he gets to have cheese breadsticks in school and that's the highlight of his week and so Thursday is like the day, the anticipatory day. I love it. That's amazing. So, he's a sweetie. Um, and I'm very excited about our guest today. And because you guys know I'm a seven and I like to laugh and I love joy and I think our world needs more joy. And I love the intersection of goodness and bringing joy and laughter to people and healing. And so, um, and, and um, the, um, our guest today, Hope England, who I'm gonna introduce in a second, Hope is a fellow at the Witness Institute. And a couple of weeks ago, we interviewed Ariel Berger um, and we talked to him about his um, discipleship relationship with Ellie Wiesel and the Witness Institute. So go back and listen to that if you guys haven't listened to that already. Incredible, incredible guy doing great dialogue work around hard issues. And Hope is a fellow there. So we're going to talk a little bit about that with Hope. But um, but Hope England, so you founded this organization called um, Humor for Hope, where you basically help people who are going through trauma and you use comedy and improv to help with the healing process and all of that. So very excited about the intersection of laughter and pain, um, you know, talking about that. And Hope, I have to say, I hopped on your website and you have like the best tagline ever, which is fight fear with funny and let oh. compassion <laughs> And let compassion be contagious. Fight fear with funny and let compassion be contagious. It's good. It's good, right? Brilliant. <laughs> Thank it's, you. Yeah. Did you come up with that with yourself, Hope? I did. You know, um, sometimes things come to me in my sleep and it's like, I'll just get these kind of downloads and it just happened. And I woke up and was like, oh, that's, yep, yeah, that's it. That's good. That's it. <laughs> We're going to yeah. go with it. But you have to tell everybody your title. And what's your title? um laugh chief laugh ambassador chief is laugh that, that ambassador <laughs> i was like is that my title <laughs> yes that's amazing that's chief just amazing that and, and, and hope if any of us were to give have that title were to, to suggest that title inside of our organizations we'd be laughed off the door All right like <laughs> no i mean <laughs> Come, you can come work with us. Can you do more of them? Oh, I would love to. Um, and Hope, you are a trained psychotherapist. Um, so you deal with trauma, people who are going through grief with a lot of different populations. You go into hospitals and you also help children who are dealing with uh, cancer, chronic illness. You have helped in refugee camps and like all the gamut of, of really hard pain and loss of people. So you're a trained psychotherapist. You're also a trained comedian. Like you have this amazing blend here and one of my bucket list I have to tell you hope is actually want to take improv classes and I haven't been able to you're giving me this look like this is a bad thing. no you have to that that's the look of like come join us is that that look yeah yes yeah oh, yes it's you amazing. should absolutely do it. okay you'll I'm meet gonna... amazing people and like touch into parts of yourself that maybe you didn't even know were there it's it's so much fun and it's very healing Great. And hope. Okay. So I, I want to get into your story of how yeah. you kind of went into humor for hope, how it all found it. But you actually last night, so you guys hope sends an email last night. It's like, by the way, you probably should know that in August <laughs> I was paralyzed from what was it? The neck down. Did you say it was like mm -hmm. the neck, the neck down? Um, and I thought, what in the, that is like, it, it is, it's a very improv -y thing, like just to drop it. And so, but I, can you tell us before we get started on like your whole journey, what has happened to you in the past six months? And um, just like, give us a quick summary 
of yeah, sure. August till now. Sure. Um, thanks for asking. Also, thanks for having me, ladies. I didn't say that. I'm so excited to be here. So I'm um, really grateful to share space with you. Um, yeah. So let's see. Last May, I left to go do some work in Guatemala in a very small village there. And I was coming back from Guatemala back to Chicago for a huge audition, actually, um, with the Second City. And I had not worked with them in years. So this was really surprising for me that they reached out to me, like, can you come? I was like, really? Do you guys have the wrong email? Because I've not worked at Second City in like eight years. Um, and they're like, no, can, please come. And so I moved my trip or my flight back and, and came back to Chicago early. And on the flight home, started to feel really, really sick. You know, when your body just kind of shuts down and you're like, oof, something's not right. Mm -hmm. Um, and by the time I got home from the airport, I was kind of already down and three days later I had to go to the hospital because, uh, I, I got COVID was one piece of this. Um, but I started to experience numbness in my hands and feet and also my teeth. And so, you know, they told me the hospital, like it's probably COVID hands and feet is what they called it. And just go home and take care of yourself and, and kind of ride this thing out. And two days later I had to go back because I couldn't get up I couldn't walk to the bathroom I couldn't do anything and then I would I think day six I was completely immobile like I had to my friend's parents had to come help like get me down the stairs from her apartment so um so yeah I got COVID and that triggered something called Jean Bray syndrome GBS for short and essentially it's a slow progression of paralysis where my body was eating my own nerves so um, I spent two weeks in the ICU at Northwestern and then, um, a little over a month at Shirley Ryan ability lab, shout out to Shirley Ryan. They're amazing. Also, thank you to the doctors at Northwestern. Um, but yeah, they told me, you know, I had the most severe variant called AMSAN and they said, we don't know if you'll ever walk again. And if you do, uh, it's going to be a very long hard recovery like years and so um I you know of course grappled with that and was really struggling and was definitely in a dark place but also had to access humor and um and I think making jokes kind of helped me get through that process and connecting with staff and other patients on the floor and um doing rehab with them actually brought me so much light so uh I was in intensive rehab until mid-November, and then I had a goal for myself that I wanted to snowboard. So uh, I left Chicago, went out to Colorado, and learned to snowboard. <laughs> and I'm, I'm walking, and and I'm good. You know, like if you didn't know anything happened and you saw me on the street, or if you if you didn't know me, you wouldn't know anything had happened. So um, I do have some weird kind of like sympathetic issues as far as like regulating my heart rate and my body temperature and things like that. But it's also improving and I'm pretty much back to normal out here running around. So mm -hmm. uh, it's been a wild, wild process, but I wouldn't be where I am without the community of people around me. And also these healthcare workers who are so burnt out and mm -hmm. overworked and underpaid and just, you know, are suffering from things like compassion fatigue were so good to me so good to me like would stay in my room after hours and talk to me and share their lives and we would make jokes and make little videos and tiktoks together and so um wouldn't be here without them yeah. so yeah I think that's amazing that the work that you do like intersected with your life right <laughs> like but 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 okay huh. so, but you're saying too hope that you telling jokes helped you like not just other people giving you laughter but like you yourself initiating it talk, talk to us about that yeah I mean I so I was isolated too because I had COVID so I couldn't see anybody and um couldn't move so literally was just in one spot all day and they would have to come turn me or you know I'd have to use a bedpan or get help going to the restroom but I think I was so sad. I was really, really sad. Mm -hmm. 
uh, because I just thought there's still so much I want to do, you know, and like, I love going to work in Guatemala and, and that involves like carrying a 50 pound backpack around and like camping. Um, and I didn't know if I'd ever be able to do things like that again. So honestly, it's just, I think for me, I can't have the darkness without the lightness and comedy or humor is it's not for me it's not a way to bypass or distract it's like I'm actually speaking truth like there is truth in comedy so when I was cracking jokes with my nurses like it was pretty dark but it was real and then we could laugh and kind of connect and also for me it was kind of a barometer of like my healing when my sense of humor starts to come back I'm like okay I'm still in there you know I kind of come back to life a little bit so um like I had a mood ring on <laughs> and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't move. So I couldn't take it off. And one of the nurses was like, wow, your mood ring is so beautiful. Like, what's your mood today? And I said, crippled. And she was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> <"It's too soon." laughs> I was like, is it though? It was <laughs> this is where we're at. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, they, um, you're like, you're like, this is not beat around the bush. Like, this is where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just get to it. <laughs> oh, so and I already, and I started writing, um, well, with voice text, like a stand up special called the sit down stand up special, because I thought, you know, I don't know if I'll ever be able to stand up again. So, what a great title for this! So, just cool. stuff like that. And, and I think that's also like the signs of somebody who is very internally, um, it's, it's part of your DNA that, like, uh, of laughter and of healing and offering it to other people, like that it, it's just going to happen in whatever context that you're in, you're going to bring that in. So, I love that. I'm so yeah. glad you're okay. I I was so like I started reading your email and I'm like, what, what? No, no, no. But then I got to the end and I'm like, oh good, she's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. But, I mean, yeah. I, I've been so lucky, truly. And yeah. Um, some of the people I met, you might hear my dog barking. He might join us too, by the way. But some of the people I met in the rehab hospital have stories that are just tragic and insane. And I was um, they placed me on the neurological floor at Shirley Ryan, which was mostly stroke. So I was the youngest one on the unit with mostly elderly folks. And um, like something that really helped me turn a corner was we had group therapy, like group rehab workout therapy together. And I couldn't, I still couldn't move really and was in a wheelchair. And so, you know, they were as well, but something that helped me was I would see like 92 year old women in there like getting it every day like hustling trying to work out lift these weights walk on these treadmills like and one of them shared her story like she's had cancer several times and she had a stroke and she's going through all this stuff and she's in here still like fighting for her life mm -hmm. and I was like oh, mm -hmm. if she can do it I can do it that's you know right. like yeah so and that's honestly how we connected because she asked me like why are you here in group and um, they were all lifting like two pound weights. And when the therapist asked me like, what size weights do you want? And I was like, I want the 30 pounders, but I couldn't move, you know? And so they were all like, what? I was like, I'm just kidding. I had to like hold a ribbon, you know, that was my <laughs> <laughs> So I love it when in, the, when in the least likely places we find like these stories of heroes and like, it's just incredible. We are not looking for it. And like, there it is. There's the 92 year old woman who's inspiring you to, like keep going, keep pressing forward. So Hope, let's back up. Let's back up um, and tell us, because I want to get to the bigger picture too of getting you to the place you're at right now. Um, tell us about your journey into comedy, into therapy, and then the intersection of when it became this kind of budding idea of humor for hope. Yeah, happy to. Um, so I grew up in the South. I'm from a very small town outside of Tennessee and um, my parents got divorced uh, when I was two and my brother was four. So it was a pretty nasty divorce and um, was pretty traumatic at times. And I think for my brother and I, and even with my parents, you know, as well, our love language was not so much like words of affirmation or um, quality time although that was also sprinkled in there, it was more so like joking. That's how we connected. Like things would get so bad that kind of the only way to find levity or come up for air was we would make jokes. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, also as a way to kind of distract from the reality of what was going on. So I think my brother, especially he's, I mean, people say I'm funny, but my brother is, please don't tell him this very funny. <laughs> um, and so that just became our kind of bond and shared common language. So I think I learned that very early on. Um, and then in college, I went to the University of Tennessee and took a theater class as an elective just because I had to, I had to fulfill a requirement for something. And, and we had to um, give this big performance for about 300 people in our theater class. And I forgot all of my lines, like all of them. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. That's like a so, nightmare scenario for people. <laughs> yeah, that's what we right. have nightmares about, yeah. Right. We could work on that trauma <laughs> to me at my therapy office. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> so I forgot my lines and I got on stage and I just made it up, like just whatever, something came out of my mouth. And my professor after class said, I need to see you. And I was like, I'm gonna flunk this class. Like, oh. here we go. <laughs> and she was said, do you know what improv is? And I was like, no. She said, did you make all of that up? And then up on stage and I said yes and she was like you should really go study improv mm. and of course I was like I don't know what that is whatever and probably went back to my room and slept but um later started to look it up and realized like improv was a thing and saw that like the improv mecca is here in Chicago mm -hmm. and like Tina Fey studied here and um Steve Carell and uh, Stephen Colbert and you know all these amazing amazing comedians have studied here and I was hooked so I told my parents I was dropping out <laughs> and <laughs> moving to Chicago and they were like no you're not because that's insane and I was like I'm so unhappy here yes I am and mm -hmm. I did it so I just moved and I lived on someone's porch it was nuts and um became an intern at Second City so I could take classes for free because I was so broke and eventually worked my way up and they hired me and I worked in the training center there and you know was kind of writing and performing with my friends and that's how that all unfolded but at the same time I think moving away from home also helped me realize like there's a lot of unresolved stuff that I have living in me in terms of like my own childhood trauma and so I was really going through it um, and got myself into therapy and realized as I was doing my own trauma work that there was so much overlap between what, what I was learning in kind of my therapy and also what I was learning in improv, like safety, trust, presence, kind of uh, being in the present moment, connection, community, like it's all so important for our healing. And so I was like, wow, these two things overlap in so many ways. And I think in, in a lot of ways, what I wasn't able to say in therapy, because it, you know, so much was in there that I couldn't even speak it. Um, I was able to embody it and play it as characters and release it that way. Um, so I saw these two things and was like, this is amazing. And this is what I want to do, I think, with my life. I don't know if this exists, but I'll try to make it exist. And left Second City, kind of had a quarter life crisis and was like, I didn't, I didn't want to be the person, and I felt like I was, who was kind of saying always like, come to my show, come see me perform, come watch me. I felt pretty self-indulgent and left Second City, was incredibly depressed, <laughs> ran off to Alaska, I don't know, and um, <laughs> was like hiking around, <laughs> had to get rescued. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> but um, while I was there, I had, kind of had this idea to marry the two. And so when I came back to Chicago, I contacted Lurie Children's Hospital and I started volunteering there. And I had an amazing supervisor and she said, you know, we're having trouble engaging some of the kids on isolation units here. The ones that are, you know, going through like extended chemo treatment who can't leave their rooms, you know, it's pretty bleak. And so I said, can I just wear an isolation suit and go in and try improv because there was a day that a magician came and a lot of the kids couldn't see the magician because of uh, risk of infection purposes so so she said yeah you can try it. it I don't know if it'll work you know um so I tried it it worked and <laughs> 
and it's like it was kind of this patch adams type situation i don't know if you've seen that movie but like mm-hmm. i would have the kids lined up at their doorways because they couldn't leave their rooms and i'd be out in the hallway just doing crazy stuff um, <laughs> and wow. yeah it was such a beautiful experience and through that work like kids started to tell me their stories you know if we could if we could laugh together and um and go deep in that way i think that helped build some trust so that then they started sharing their stories with me and and so i would say like you know i i have cancer and i've been given three months to live or you know this is what's happening or i had an amputation last week and i'll never walk again or or even parents you know or caregivers um would see their kids laughing and then they would open up to me so so at that moment i was kind of like something special is happening here and I want to make sure I'm tending to this and holding it the right way. So I went back to school and got a degree in clinical counseling Mm. and trauma work. And so then created a humor for hope or nonprofit and married the two and now we're doing it. (laughs) That's awesome. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. That's, it seems like a really like a natural progression, but it probably took a lot of courage for you to do all those major shifts, like even like quitting university, <laughs> like you know, going against your parents. So I feel like there's certain people that zag, you know, instead of zigging, you know, people mm. go here, like, but I feel like that's what improv does too. It's like a, a, a surprise. You're like, it's, and that's what, what brings humor is that you're, you're coming at the issue from a different perspective. That's really surprising. And um, I don't know, like for me personally, if I'm having a hard time, if you make me laugh, my perspective snaps mm-hmm. back into perspective. Like when I'm like, oh, okay, I've, you know, now I'm, I have a better, I see things better or I things, see things differently. Like, what do you, what do you think it is about comedy or humor that helps the person like shift that mindset? Like, how does that work? Mm, that's a great question. Thanks for that. I think something I noticed so when I used to work at Second City I also worked as a server there when I first started because I was like I'll do anything to be in this building um I used to watch several performers that I really looked up to Tim Robinson is one of them if you guys know him like he's maybe the funniest person I've ever met um and has a great Netflix special out there right now but I would watch people come into these main stage shows disconnected you know stressed out uh, overwhelmed, not making eye contact with each other, kind of pushing and stuff to get to the door, get a good table, get a good seat, whatever. And then at the end of the show, after laughing and and watching these shows, like they would leave holding hands, they would leave engaged, they were making eye contact. It's like their whole mindset had shifted. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think part of it is it, it kind of like in therapy when we use this, it's like we go so deep. And we use it as a way to kind of come back up for air. Like mm-hmm. I think Anne Lamott calls laughter carbonated holiness. Mm-hmm. And it's um it's just like uh it's it's kind of a reset, like brings people back online in a way, um, and helps kind of reset whatever narrative we've been caught in. So um that's kind of how I see it. I love that. I love that pit, carbonated holiness. That's really good. Um, <laughs> you know what I think, Hope? I think that a lot of people, when they, um, like when they think of laughter, um, when you're in your darkest moments, like some, I think within a lot of us, there is kind of like this, we know we need something that's different from all the weightiness Maybe I'll, 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 I'll frame this too in the context of the world right now, where it just feels like everything is so weighty right now mm. um, between COVID and different divisions and everything. And I think inside of us, sometimes we know, like, oh, I just, I need, I need to laugh. I need to do something that takes, almost takes us away from me. But I want you to talk about the difference between laughter as escapism and laughter as a means to healing, because that's what you do. You use it as a means of healing, not just, hey, let me, for 20 minutes, let me take you out of the situation, but actually like, hey, let this, what if this is the seed of this new journey that you're taking? How can we think about laughter 
that helps us through these weighty times, hard times, instead of just like momentarily escaping them? How can it jumpstart us into thinking, living differently, more hopefully maybe? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So something we say in the improv world, there is truth in comedy, right? Like there's, there is a seed of truth in every kind of joke or our sense of humor. And, and also just like trauma, laughter is universal, right? We can't have one without the other really. So um, we, I think, I think our world, our present day world, so much of it is built on disconnection, you know, and distraction. And we are using laughter as a way to reconnect us to our shared humanity. Like mm. I did some work, I think back in 2015 with a group of doctors, um, they're amazing. They work with an organization called Women Rising. Um, and I was, I tagged along with them. And then, you know, when they were doing their work, I just said, can I do improv stuff with some of the women and kids? And they were like, yeah, sure, go for it. <clears throat> and we didn't speak the same language. So I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna do this, but I can kind of improvise it, <laughs> figure it out. And we didn't need to speak the same language. You know, it's like, it's universal. So we mm. could connect and act things out. And, um, and we laughed so hard, you know, we, we were really able to create kind of this unspoken dialogue. Um, mm -hmm. through laughter and so yeah we we use kind of the where people are at like meeting them where they're at and their their lived experience and whatever is in there that they're willing to kind of share and work with that you know we're not making jokes about things or laughing at other people it's like where can I where can I locate myself within this mm -hmm. and um and use it to reconnect to other people. Yeah. And that's, I think where part of the healing comes from. Yeah. Cause you, of course you can laugh, you can, you can do things to distract yourself and numb out. But I think that's the last thing we need right now. You know, yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Need, we need each other. So, yeah. Um, it's interesting. Cause we were talking to Ariel a couple weeks ago. He had said that when he thinks about the big issues of the world, he said, oftentimes we are, we want to run towards like the solution and the answer but he said in reality the solution is going deeper inside of ourselves mm. and finding that which we don't know exists we don't know it's there we don't know how it's impacting us or what and I thought that was really helpful too um because that's a little bit what what you're saying as you're talking that's reminding me of that as well um so I know Anne do you have a question sorry I know Anne has a question too yeah Really? Well, yes, but not a question, but like you're actually reminding me of my friend. She's, she uses um, theater for, for healing as well. Mm -hmm. um, but with kids who were former child soldiers mm -hmm. uh, in the Congo and, you know, after they come out, they have very few memories of anything joyful or happy or good. And they're still kids, you know? Um, and so then they come out and they're just, they just don't know how to reintegrate into mm -hmm. society. So then she works with them and, and just has them actually just remember something joyful and then strike that pose and try to like act mm -hmm. it. <laughs> and then she's like, Oh, go freeze. And then they're like frozen. And then she goes around and she's like, what are you trying to communicate? And then they, they are able then to remember a moment of joy. Yeah. Uh, and then they can remember each other's moments of joy too. And, and it's, I think that's powerful. So I can imagine what you're doing is powerful as well. That's so beautiful. So it, it kind of reminds me of, of in 2017, uh, we got asked to go do some work on the Syrian border. And, um, and so we were working with um, children that were refugees and uh, had been victims of the war there and were experiencing trauma. And that was something that we learned was, first of all, we couldn't even say the word trauma, right? Because they're still living it. So that was kind of a, a, a new learning for us. And then we had to improvise like, okay, we're gonna scrap everything we had planned and just roll with it. And also kind of let the kids tell us what they need. But um, 
that's something that we learned was in the beginning when we were trying to teach this concept of improv, everything that was coming up in these scenes was really tragic or like drowning scenes or shooting scenes or war scenes or, you know, everything that they had experienced or seen in some way. And so through the two weeks that we were there, we got to see this beautiful progression of them being able to kind of step outside of their trauma in a way or, or work through it in such a way that by the end of the two weeks, their scenes were about all kinds of things, you know, all, like really joyful things and eating in restaurants and, you know, it's like street parties and all these things that they weren't able to access before because, you know, as, as it goes with trauma, we get stuck in it oftentimes and it fragments us. So to see them bring back and reintegrate all these beautiful parts was like, oh, that was the healing, you know? So it's really beautiful that your friend does that. I feel like you guys should connect. <laughs> I, I would she- love that. Well, she's one of those people that I look at and we just look at each other and we just bust out laughing because mm. she's just a person of so much joy. Um, so anyway, mm-hmm. so I had a question for you. Um, for people who I feel like because of COVID and whatever else is happening, I think our understanding of mal- mental health has really increased. Like we're mm-hmm. way more aware of it. We're able to actually um, name it and say that we are also like traumatized as well so then like what would your advice be for people who are kind of in that like that space that's really kind of stuck or can't really remember what life was like before COVID you know what I mean or like kind of struggling what advice or how would you um, advise them to like bring themselves to others yeah I think the first thing I would say is you're not alone like everybody we've all been experiencing our own kind of version of whatever COVID has has brought up for us um and we're living in very uncertain tough times um so you're not alone and it's normal you know it's it's I want to validate what people are feeling because your our nervous systems are telling us like something's not right like it's not right for us to be so disconnected to be so distracted to be so sick to be so scared to be so alone um and One, I would say therapy, like has been a game changer for myself, you know, as, and I go as a therapist, but, but it's a great way to work through your stuff and kind of figure out where you're getting blocked and, um, and to have someone that's just there for you every week, you know, to show up as you need to, and to help kind of work through this in a way that equips you with certain tools and support that maybe you didn't know was there, um, and then, you know, if therapy is not accessible for some people, which is a whole nother issue that, you know, we could talk about in this country. <laughs> um, um, but I think community is so important. You know, how can you connect with others to know that, uh, mm-hmm. that there is support there and that you're not alone in this. And, you know, our nervous systems are wired for connection. So um, that's a big one. And yeah, how are you nurturing yourself? Like, this world will eat us up, you know, the way it's set up. So how are you pausing to have mindful moments of like, what do you actually need? Um, And kind of locating yourself in this swirling storm Mm -hmm. we're in. Hope, have you noticed a difference between working with children and with adults Mm -hmm. in terms of like being able to access laughter in a way that is healing do one or the other is it easier does it depend on personality what have you found <clears throat> um you know i think i think kids have less armor built up um i think adults at least the adults we've worked with are a little more hesitant to like step in and play and it's almost like we haven't worked that muscle so we've forgotten how to use it like how do i with all my corporate, you know, coworkers get out here and play and crawl around and do all this crazy character work. And Mm -hmm. like, I'm a bear with lasers, you know, like we have to kind of bring that back online, this sense of imagination and play and Mm -hmm. one wonder and awe kids typically step into that a little Mm -hmm. more easily. Um, but it's really beautiful to see adults kind of unlearn and then, you know, step into that again it's like a light switch comes on and they're like 
<laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> we can do this, you know, like this is fun. Do, does most of what you do, is it um, like interactive? Like, are you asking the other person to also like be part of this, you know, imaginary world or to, part, or is it like more of a watching They're you know, they're kind of a spectator. How do you go about this? Yeah, we always give people a choice because, you know, in, in healing trauma, like choice is so important. Mm -hmm. um, so we always give people a choice, you know, whether they want to participate or be an audience member, or just support in some way. Um, but yeah, it's super interactive. I mean, yeah. people are, people are definitely, in, you know, playing, interacting, talking, eye contact, touch, if they're comfortable with that in some scenes. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's super interactive and, and that's intentional. Um, I think because one movement is so important for healing trauma, you know, like, like reconnecting with ourselves, not just others and, um, moving through a space and moving the body and releasing energy that way. So everything we do is pretty interactive. Yeah. Yeah. What do you tell, like, Okay, so you're there and then you make them, you make people laugh and it's wonderful. And mm. then they leave. And what is like continuing laughter and joy look like? Like, how do you, how do you encourage them to make that part of like their daily or their weekly routine? Yeah. So something we're working on right now with humor for hope is something that we are calling train the trainer so that we're not, and that's something we also learned in Turkey was. I think I felt a lot of guilt and shame over, we came in, we did this thing. Uh, it really opened the kids up. It, we all experienced joy and got to play and then we left. And I, I felt a lot, I felt very heavy mm. um, and was really struggling through that a bit. So something we're doing now is just kind of training others to do this work um, so that they can take it with them wherever they go. I yeah. think, um, in terms of extending that, you know, past our workshops or retreats or whatever, so much of it is about mindfulness and presence, you know, it, and it's not just joke, 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 joke. It's, yeah. it's so much more, um, and helping people understand that we don't have to be so serious all the time. We're literally, you know, floating around on the speck of dust, <laughs> like what really matters, mm -hmm. uh, is, I think relationship, compassion, love, connection, um, and humor can be a shared common language. So, I mean, we definitely give and offer tools, but um, yeah, so much of what we do is just kind of embodying. So that's a great question. I, I might need to sit with that one a little longer. Yeah, or I just think like there's people like me who want to make people laugh but then we don't want to be inappropriate <laughs> sure. like this really is it's an art and it almost feels like a science it's like both where <laughs> you can't just like jump in and and tr if somebody's not there then yeah. they're right I mean how many times have we had somebody say something funny when it was the totally in inappropriate time for it and yeah. so I think just like if we are going to be people who want to help other people and we want to do it through laughter like do you have any tips for us yeah. in that way yeah so a big thing that we that we teach or offer um that's both in the improv world and in this kind of therapeutic world is active listening like and reading the room and it, that's an improv thing is like you're re you're constantly reading your audience of like okay where are they at is this joke gonna hit do i need to, de to delay two seconds do we need to scrap this joke like really feeling the energy of the space. Um, and that's something we, we work on very, very early on. Like that's kind of a, one of the main pillars of our work. Um, and I would also say it's something we really stand behind is doing our own inner work. So like, I understand that as a white woman, like I'm not gonna go to, a, to the South side of Chicago where we do work and be like, I'm gonna teach you guys comedy no you know like these kids are already so funny and they know what they need mm. we're just providing the platform so um I think deep active listening giving folks choices and 
and also developing a sense of trust. Like mm -hmm. when we first ran our, um, our hall pass program with CPS before COVID put a stop to it for a little bit, my co-facilitator and I, we just went to the school to meet with the kids about two or three times before we ever even started the program, mm -hmm. just to get to know them, just to be in the space with them, just to ask them like, what would make you feel safe in this space? What do you need from us? Mm -hmm. um, and also we let them know we're never gonna push you. Like we're not here to talk at you, to teach at you. We don't have all this knowledge to bestow upon you. Like we're just here to work with you and partner in some way. Um, and Hope, and what, that, what is that? What was the Hall Pass program? What is that? Yeah, so it's a 12 or 10 to 12 week program that we run in the school systems here at CPS. Mm -hmm. um, and we mostly work with schools that are underfunded, underserved um, with students with high, high levels of trauma mm -hmm. um, who don't have access to like arts funding or um, adequate mental health services. I mean, I think the stats are something like there's one social worker for every like 800 something oh. students in CPS. This was from a few years ago, oh. so that hopefully that's changed with COVID, but like, it's insane. So, so we're doing the improv work and also kind of, you know, offering therapeutic services where we can, if the, if the kids are interested in that. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what Hall Pass is. Okay, great. Thanks. That's so good. Thanks for Thanks. all your work you're doing with like kids and like adults. And honestly, it's awesome. You should come up to Toronto. It'd be really great. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. I would love to, you know, something I, I will add to, to that that just popped in my head is in terms of feeling kind of safe and building a sense of trust is we always, always, uh, try to have teaching artists who are from the communities that we work in. So I'm not, you know, I'm not the one leading it and talking about it. It's like our teaching artists who are from these communities mm. who are amazing, who know these communities, you know, and live in them are, are leading and teaching. So um, I think that also helps. I wanted to switch tactics a little bit and ask about your, we chatted before we actually went live um, about your 13 lives that you've crammed into your one <laughs> life and all of your travel and your crazy experiences. Like, can you tell us like a, one of your favorite experiences that pops immediately to mind? Mm. Hmm. Um, gosh, there's so many. Uh, this is the best of improv. Good job, Anne. Well done. Well done. Putting her on the spot. <laughs> really putting me on the spot. Come on, now we're going to show what you're made of. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I'm um, creating a space for you. <laughs> you know, something that comes to mind that, that really just profoundly impacted my life was when I was in Guatemala, uh, this was a few years ago, I did something called a dark retreat. Uh, mm -hmm. So I do silent meditation retreats quite a bit just to like continue to do my own work and connect with myself and mm -hmm. work through some of my own stuff. Um, and it's just a deep spiritual practice for me that I keep coming back to. And I decided to really up it and do something called a dark retreat, which is where you're in total darkness, uh, sensory deprived, alone for however many days you choose. And something in me told me two weeks. And I was like, no, like, really? <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready. <laughs> and it's like, it's whatever you want to call it, like, was just telling me like, yeah, it's, you're ready. It's, it's time. So um, mm -hmm. I did do this dark retreat in a cave alone for two weeks. And it was so profound. It just altered me in so many ways uh, and kind of helped me, uh, reminded me that, we all have the light within us mm. and, you know, we are kind of God in this way, discovering itself or the universe discovering itself. And we have everything that we need, you know, and, and so much of that is each other. That was a big one. Um, trying to think of another, <laughs> uh, I've done all kinds of stuff. I mean, I ran off to the desert and did this like um, mist, I went to this mystic kind of Sufi camp and we danced around in the desert for, <laughs> for a few weeks. Um, I've, yeah. Is that like I a mean, burning man type thing? <laughs> it, mystic, uh, mystical or? Yeah, it was with these, um, like Afghani mystics who did this amazing huh. magical drumming and kind of would get you in this trance state. And it was kind of a spiritual practice, uh, which was yeah, my friend was like, do you want to go? I was like, yeah, sure, let's do it. Um, 
yeah, I have a lot of stories. I, one place I really kind of found myself was I moved to and lived on a commune in Costa Rica for a little bit, a spiritual commune and um, met some amazing people there. And we, I found myself with a shaman and did the ayahuasca ceremony, which was insane and beautiful and very profound. And it was just done so, so beautifully. Um, so that's something, yeah. I, I, have both, all I feel like you have a book in you too. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an editor and a writer, like in my other life. And I'm, I'm like listening to, and like, this is a book where like each chapter is like a location and then, you know, kind of helping people understand how location also like teaches you all these lessons and these different, I can't even imagine doing a two week silent retreat let alone a darkened one like that actually sounds scary to me I think <laughs> I could maybe do for like two minutes and then I'd be running out of the cave um, baby steps oh so do we say this and Lori is actually hosting a writing retreat I am hosting okay. a writing retreat and you guys are gonna get more information on that soon I promise um wow amazing I you know it's funny you say that it's not in a cave hope it's not a bummer. it's not silent we're actually gonna talk to each other so, all right i'll still yeah. come <laughs> you could be our comedic relief in all of it that'd be great yeah yeah that'd i'll just step in during intermission yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's um, funny though you, you say that my friends are always like when are you gonna write a book and i'm like i'm i have add i'm too distracted i mean i would love to yeah um but for now i just create characters and do that but if you want to partner i'm i'm happy to do that great of course i would i would love it do an um, audio recorded audio uh, you know that's true. Yeah, that's, that's a great talk, idea. Just talk and once you're done with your two week dark and silent retreat, then you spend two weeks just talking nonstop in the light. Everything you know what I it. did? I, I did bring in a recorder in the silence because I was like, I knew a lot was going to come up and I did record. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just haven't listened to it yet because mm. I, I don't know. I, I guess I just was scared or wasn't ready, mm. but I'm sure there's a lot there. Yeah, I bet. Hope this was so great. I wish you had a whole another hour to talk because I, I, I still wanted to ask you about Alaska and you having kind of that moment where you're like, oh no, you can't, you can't raise your hand. What, Anne? We have to wrap up. Anne's raising her hand. Anne. Yes. All the fellows in the Witness Institute, yeah. who do you recommend that we approach next to interview? Uh -huh. Good question. Oof. I will say that the Witness Institute has been so powerful, so powerful in so many ways. Um, and everybody, all the fellows are so different. You know, that's something that I've learned is like, we all have different beliefs. We all have different stances and takes on things. Um, someone, hmm. Well, we'll take this offline. Okay. I um, think, well, you want me to, should I pause? We'll take it offline. Because okay. then who you don't recommend is gonna feel bad. So we gotta keep our. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I would recommend all of them. All for of them. Sure. I love the witness institute one, but yeah, Ariel's helpful. doing up there. Um, Hope, I love this conversation. I love how you kind of, you follow your heart, you follow your heart and what you're passionate about. And then you jump in and you do it. Like we didn't miss the details about you sleeping on a porch and all these <laughs> things. And it's, it's actually a, a really good lesson for some of us who maybe like live in a more of a place of fear um mm -hmm. to you know to dream big and then you know what what steps maybe it's not moving across the country but maybe there are some little steps that people could take to step into more of what they feel like they really want to do or they feel called to do so i think that's a really good word kind of that your whole the arch of your story um for all of us and then like second understanding too that laughter is um it doesn't have to be a, an escapism. It, it actually is a main tool. And this is why we have the adage, laughter is the best medicine. Mm -hmm. Like that is, it exists for a reason. Um, in the right time and the right space, we'll totally. say that. Um, totally. Hope, we will look forward to following you and hopefully intersecting a little bit with what you do down the line. And since I'm in Chicago, I need to find a way to, need to find a way to get together in person. And that would be really fun. But thank you for being on the podcast. This was wonderful. Oh, of course. Thank you so much for having me. I've so enjoyed this. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm so grateful to be here. And yeah. thanks for listening and for being curious about this work. Yeah, that's great. So keep up the good work. And I'm going to go to my boss and ask if I could be the chief laugh officer. And 
get laughed at before. <laughs> um, thank Go you guys for, for joining us for this episode of the Hero Makers podcast. If you liked it, please share it with those you think need to hear this message. And we'll see you guys next time. Thank you.